Unvoiced consonants are those for which there is no vocal full vibration during their production. These include p, k, s, sh, f, f, and ch. Any consonant that we make without voicing is considered unvoiced. Unvoiced consonants pose a couple challenges for singers. The first is that they have no pitch because the vocal folds are not vibrating when we form these sounds. And because there's no pitch as expiratory airflow begins, or there's a stoppage of vocalized sound when we sing them within words, the intonation of the vowels that follow unvoiced consonants can be off. The second challenge is that they can be either explosive or airy, depending on their manner of articulation, which can lead to an explosive or airy tone for the vowels that follow them. The glottis is at least partially open during their production, and so there's little to no resistance to the exiting air at the glottal level, only somewhere higher up along the vocal tract. So when we're faced with these two challenges, we have to be prepared. The first place that we prepare is down with the breath management musculature. When we're singing these unvoiced consonants, we have to avoid forcing too much air pressure through the open or partially open glottis. If there's too much air flowing through the glottis during the production of the unvoiced consonant, it will make it so much more difficult to bring the vocal folds fully together for the vowel that follows. I always liken this to leaving the front door open as a hurricane comes through, and then attempting to close the door against the powerful hurricane force winds. It would be very challenging and possibly not successful. So if we achieve a level of airflow and subglottal pressure that's appropriate, we'll have a better chance at bringing our vocal folds together and closing that glottal door for the vowel. Really quickly, try briefly sustaining an unvoiced consonant and then sustaining a vowel. You can alternate between these two if you like. So, so, fa, fa. We want to make sure that we aren't squeezing so much with the support muscles that we can't produce a clean and steady vowel sound afterwards. If you find the right balance, your vowel will not be explosive or airy and your pitch will likely be more accurate. If you push too hard during the unvoiced consonant, your vowel will explode and likely be sharp in pitch. So, so. Now, this exercise obviously won't work for unvoiced consonants that can't be sustained, such as the plosives p and k, but the principle still applies. That is, the principle of not generating so high a subglottal pressure that your glottal closure mechanism is prevented from closing the glottis in a timely and complete manner. The second place that we prepare for the vowel that follows the unvoiced consonant is inside the vocal tract, and the pharynx in particular. Just as we have to tune our vocal tracks and shape them for the pitch and the sound qualities and the register that we desire before we begin our vocal phrases, we call this prephonatory tuning, we also have to prepare our vocal tracks for the vowels that we're going to sing after the unvoiced consonants. We develop a mental conception of the pitch, vowel, quality, and register split seconds before we actually initiate sound or sing the vowel. So while we're forming our unvoiced consonants, we're already shaping our vocal tracks to whatever extent possible, again this is more primarily done in the pharynx, to create the pitches and vowels that are to come after them, and we're mentally preparing for the vowels. If we sing the same exercise from earlier, we now want to focus on both holding back some of the breath pressure down lower, not squeezing with our abdominal muscles, and allowing the diaphragm to rise prematurely and the ribs to collapse, and tuning our vocal tracks and our minds for the vowels that follow. Shoo, shoo. I'm tuning my vocal tract for the oo. Fa, fa. I'm thinking the ah. We can also practice the words in our song lyrics in the same manner. A couple years back, I was helping a jazz singer work through the songs in her set list, and one of the songs that we worked on together was John Lennon's Imagine. And every time she got to the chorus, Imagine All the People, 
her tone would get airy and on the word people. So we worked on having her mentally and physically prepare for the tone and pitch of the E and U vowels that follow the P's. The extra challenge in this case was that there's an ascending intervallic leap to that word. So she had to learn to how to manage her breath pressure levels on those P's. One of the things that we did initially was minimize the P. We reduced it to its shortest possible duration and its subtlest sound. First we spoke the words while reducing the P's to almost nothing, focusing on the clarity of the vowels. E, O, E, O. Then we did the same thing as she sang the vocal phrase on pitch. Imagine all the people. Sounds a little weird. But then we gradually reintroduced a bit more P so that it sounded natural and diction was no longer compromised. But her body retained its muscle memory of the softer P's, including how she formed it up here. She wasn't exaggerating or using excessive force and pressure here with the lips. She found the right breath pressure and the correct shaping and tuning of the vocal tract. Another trick that we tried was substituting a B for the P. These two sounds are cognates, so they're formed exactly the same way here, but the B is voice, so we tend not to encounter quite the same problems with the vowels that follow. Imagine all the people. Sounds a little weird, but eventually what we did was we gradually made the B sound a little bit more like a P. Imagine all the people. Imagine all the people. Imagine all the people. We kept it nice and soft, and we got to the point where it sounded very natural, and it sounded, it sounded like it should. Thanks so much for watching today. I hope this little lesson has been helpful for you. If so, please like this video and subscribe to this channel so that you'll know whenever I post the next video. Take care.